great to see you today. Happy EMS week. And today we celebrate EMS for Children Day. So our 10th episode of the Real Emergency Vodcast will be focusing on how to best manage and treat the burned pediatric airway. Real Emergency is produced in partnership with Hand Heavy, Real DX, and 410 Medical, and it is powered by Prodigy EMS. And we'd also like to thank Axon Studios, who are supporting the education for the Real Emergency Vodcast. I am Hillary Gates, Director of Educational Strategy at Prodigy EMS. All episodes are available to you for CAPSI credit on Prodigy. So let me briefly introduce our two resident experts. Peter Antevi is a pediatric emergency medicine physician, EMS physician, and the founder of Pediatric Emergency Standards. Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at WakeMed in Raleigh, North Carolina, and he's the medical director with WakeMed Mobile Critical Care. Dr. Peel is also founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical. We are honored to have with us today a special guest who happened to be on scene during this extraordinary event that you're about to watch, and he is Dr. Marvin Wayne. Marv has been the medical program director for the EMS system in Bellingham, Washington and Whatcom County for 48 years. He is also an associate clinical (laughs) professor at the University of Washington's Department of Emergency Medicine, and Marv also happened to serve as a combat surgeon in Vietnam. Some tips for watching today. We want you to weigh in. The panelists will ask you for your feedback, for your questions. Feel free to unmute yourself, type questions in the chat, keep your camera on. And we're going to move on to this case now uh, where you will be watching footage from video laryngoscopes that captured burned and swollen airways during intubation. These patients suffered burns in a house fire, and the EMS clinicians cared for them swiftly and expertly in the ambulance on the scene. Dr. Wayne was called to the scene as well and has unique insights into their management. So let's get started. Peter, Mark, Marv, it's all yours. Right. Hillary, thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Happy EMS Week, EMSC Day. Um, I am so excited for this case, uh, these cases, because even though we've already kind of seen them ourselves, it is just incredible footage and just really grateful to you, Dr. Wayne, uh, for coming on today. Uh, Mark, great to see you. Uh, Maya Dorset, Maya, uh, welcome and thanks for being on as well. Uh, so let's get started. So before we start, let me just mention that in the past we've had body camera footage of the entire scene. Uh, we don't have that for this particular case. So what we're gonna do is use a PowerPoint. Uh, we're gonna show you some images and kind of get you there mentally. And then uh, Dr. Wayne is gonna bring us to the scene because he was there. Uh, as Hillary said. So let's get started um, with a a house fire, a fully engulfed house. It's out there in Whatcom County. And before you ask, where is Whatcom County? We figured we'd show you exactly where that is. And uh, uh, Dr. Wayne, you wanna wanna tell us exactly that you're the most Northwest County in the country? Yep, continental United States. Our Northern border is our wonderful friends and neighbors to the North in Canada. Uh, we're also actually have a small piece of land called Point Roberts, which we have no access to except through Canada, part of the 49th, being below the 49th parallel. To the east, we have the Cascade Mountains. And um, to the west, we have Puget Sound, or actually it's the San Juan Archipelago up north of Seattle. So we're about two thirds of the way from Seattle to Vancouver. And can you just quickly describe your service for people who are listening? Uh, are you fire-based? Are you third service? What type of system are you working at? We are a fire-based integrated system, city, county. Uh, at the time, we had four medic units, uh, three based in a city-based uh, operation, although we, one unit was out county. Uh, we not, and then we added a fourth unit. Um, and now we're adding a fifth unit. We have uh, 40-ish Responding BLS units are all part of fire districts that have BLS capability and transport. Today, those people have IGEL, AED, pelvic sling, uh, ITD, all kinds of technology beyond what a typical EMT might have. And of course, our ALS units are very equipped. We've been doing video laryngoscopy uh, work and research for about 16, 17 years. So we believe you don't really know how tough an innovation is or isn't, or how well it's done or not done uh, without actually seeing it. We have a process to review it with the 
medic, uh, the supervising physicians, and I review them, and we use them as part of our quality management and educational program. And just to orient everybody, just so uh, there's a lot of questions that are going to come up here. And again, what I, what I don't want to do here is play Monday morning quarterback, um, but I do want to orient people to the, uh, the the time frame here. This was approximately 10 years ago, right? Yeah. This, this right. call. Right. And so, so some drugs may be different. You want to just go through that real quick? I want to make sure yeah. people understand this. This didn't so happen last week. This is a call that we've kind of held for a variety of reasons and not used nationally. Uh, has to do with privacy and such, even though I have, I have verbal permission to be using all this. Um, and it's pretty de-identified in some ways and others not. Um, and, but the fa family has moved from the area. Uh, and uh, so just with some questions. So 2012, uh, at that time, we routinely used RSI. Sucks was our primary drug, although today it's rock. pre intubation was done with midazolam if we used it. Uh, today it would be midazolam and or, or more like a ketamine. Um, but again, uh, most of what you're going to see is what we did then is what we do now. Uh, and we try to use a uh, very effective, uh, care, uh, and maybe we're doing a little better QI now, but you know, we can always learn and every call is a learning opportunity for everyone. Um, right. And so, and so you see it's real. Right. And so, and so even if, if, if we ask you some difficult questions or we're just going to take you through that, that that's okay. Cause we, yep. what we've learned in the, in the, in the, in the last, you know, nine episodes that we've had is that it's very easy to second guess. And we just, we want to be open. We, we want to be transparent, but we're not going to come across as uh, you should have, could have, would have done that. I just want to be clear uh, of that. And we just greatly appreciate what you're doing here. It's going to be a great educational opportunity for everybody today. So okay. let's, let's, yeah, go ahead. You want to say something? No, go ahead. I'm going to say, please, okay. let's move on. Let's do it. Okay. So here we are. It's 422 in the morning, 422 in the morning. And we have some of the 911 um, audio here. We'll play that in a minute. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of explain how you got involved. But here we are, this, uh, this uh, it was really a duplex that was fully engulfed. And we'll get to the number of occupants in this house in a short while. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to this case in just a minute. So you're sleeping at 4.22 in the morning. And um, all of a sudden your pager goes off. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a pager is, it's a, it's a prehistoric inbox, basically is what that was. Uh, <laughs> So tell us what happened. You, you get paged out and they say, basically, we need you here right now. No, not exactly. Um, so the pager system works that anytime we have a multi uh, alarm fire or a multi unit response, then at that time, uh, they would page me as part of the staff tone. I'm included in the staff tone. And so uh, it isn't, hey, we really want you, uh, but unfortunately we have to put up with you. And so I got paid uh, at that time, early in the morning, awakened, uh, and the event was 10 blocks from my house. So it wasn't a huge response time. And at 422 in the morning, obviously not much in the way of traffic. So I rolled out of bed and headed out and headed wait, to the- I, Wait, I happen to have the vehicle that you traveled in, by the way. Is that, is that the, were you in that car? Is that how you got there That's, so fast? That, yes, that is my car. So yeah, Unbelievable. I, I, okay. I drive Formula Renault race cars at Laguna Seca, although they're now beginning to tell me that uh, I'm exceeding the age limit. So we'll see. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, so, okay. So it's 422. You get up out of bed. You're, you're only 10 blocks away from this, this location. Yeah. And, oh, by the way, I, I have a new name for you. You're Mar Marvio. Marvio ah. Andretti. Is that, is that good? Like that. Uh, there we that, go. That's good. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Um, we have the initial dispatch, and let's let's let everyone listen uh, in. And please let me know if you can't hear this, and maybe I forgot to press the sound thing. Hold on, go ahead. Medical staff. But you, uh, Medical staff advisory of a two minute response to one two zero eight twenty fourth Street for a residential structure fire with with entrapment of three subjects. Advisory of two minute response, one two zero eight twenty fourth street residential structure fire with two minute response. Okay, so that's that's the, the, the patch that comes out. And um, you you said you only had four medic units, correct? M one, M two, M three, and four. That's how you label them? Yeah, well, at the time we used medic one, medic two, 
Medic three and medic at the time I think we had medic forty five. Was, it, was okay. It, was so it. I, so, I have to go back ten years in my mind, and that's a long. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Okay, so um, so obviously medic two gets gets uh, is in route pretty quickly. They're on scene within a couple of minutes. Um, we'll end up talking about the transport, but I put this here just to let everyone know, just so, so you could all see what the on, on scene time was, and you'll hear and see what happened in a minute. Uh, which is pretty incredible and life-saving. Uh, so that's the first medic unit. Um, then we have another tone out of the, of the ladder trucks. Let's take a listen to that. Oh, and okay. Well, trust me on that one. There, <laughs> the 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 ladder was toned out, and um, and now we're out there on the scene. Um, and so, what 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 I wanted to do is kind of look at this image, and I want everyone on the on the call to start to think what's gonna happen when you get there because that pre-arrival information and um, I wanna bring Zach in and, and Maya and Mark and others. But first let's start with you, Marv. You know you have three, three patients and then it turns out you had a fourth patient who actually got out uh, with, with only uh, superficial burns, but they were, they were pretty badly, pretty badly burned, but he, 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 he wasn't really a, a patient who was too critical at the time. But knowing you have three occupants in a house, Dr. Wayne, what, what, are, what are you thinking? What are your teams thinking in route to this call? Well, the good news is the, the really serious stuff had been done before I got there in the sense of the fire. So when I arrived, we had multiple units. The latter had actually started uh, spraying water on the adjacent houses uh, to protect them. Uh, and so the history is as follows. And I think this is important. Um, Dad and a guest were sleeping in the living room because it was a small house. The back bedroom, mother and two children were sleeping and the door, as it turned out to the back bedroom had gotten blocked by fire. So there was no egress for them directly except potentially through windows and they weren't very big, it was an older, older home. Dad and the guests broke out the front. The guests broke out right away, did not get any significant burns, did not get a significant inhalation. Dad had, uh, as you'll see, 30 to 40 plus percent burns of uh, various degrees because he tried to get back into the house to get to his, uh, his family. <clears throat> On arrival of the first engine company, which was close, was in, uh, engine two, which is again, only several blocks away. Uh, the captain on the scene um, heroically broke through the window wall and grabbed and set out handing out people, uh, again with flame around, but mostly smoke. So the front part of the house was flame, the back part of the house was smoke. So again, you can look at the type of injuries and you'll better understand it by if you see what is what you know that perspective. And we'll get to that in a minute. And so what I want to do is I want to bring in uh, Zach. So Zach, you're a critical care medic. You you know you you brought us a lot of the videos that we we run here um, on this webinar. You're from the from the paramedics mind, you know you're going to a structure fire with occupants. What are you thinking in route to that call? The first thing is just how many patients and resources would I potentially need? Uh, and then based off of my location, wherever you're at, whether you're rural, urban, things like that, where where can I take these patients? So if I've got I've got one patient, hopefully you know I can get them to the uh, closest burn center. If I have four or five patients, do I want to overwhelm that burn center, that one hospital with all of these patients at once? Probably not. So um, those would be the two biggest things, just who do I need to help me? And then where do I need to get them as soon as we're able to stabilize them in the field? Fantastic. So Dr. Wayne, what are the resources that you have in your area, knowing that you have three critical, maybe even a fourth, uh, what are the resources you have and what were you thinking in your mind with respect to resources? Well, let's begin. My first resource is I accept, I have exceptional firefighters, EMTs and paramedics. So we're gonna start with that and, and make that particular assumption. However, yeah. however, I have one hospital. Uh, it's a level two trauma center, uh, but at 440 in the morning, staffing, who knows wise, as far as you know, being prepared for this many critical patients. Uh, the EMS uh, supervisor on scene immediately called the hospital and gave him a heads up for obviously though, our next closest facility that can handle typically burns, Harborview in Seattle, that's 110 miles. Um, and obviously not something you just go trudging off to. So we're faced with what do we do at the scene? 
<clears throat> where do we go and what do we do when we get to the hospital and how I can fill people in on that as we go. So, so now, and then that's, that was perfect. And Zach, uh, Zach's other comment was your resources. Now, as I understand it, you have two medic units coming to the scene, correct? Yes, with four paramedics. Two paramedics. With four par big, uh, and we had an EMS supervisor and then me, have, me tripping over everybody. Right. So I want everyone to start thinking about what would you do? You'll see what Marv and his team did in a minute. Well, actually, what, hit, what, what the team and then Marv did, because Marv always graciously um, um, kind of acquiesces to his amazing crew uh, on the scene. And, and he just assists where is, where is necessary. That's why he's such a great medical director. But what would you do if you have four patients and two ambulances? Um, was that going through your mind, Marv? As, as you were coming to the scene? It, it, it sort of did. Um, I'd be honest, let's be honest. When I got there, and pardon the expression, but the, the poop was hitting the fan. I mean, things were happening very rapidly. Uh, we have a fully engulfed house. We're protecting surrounding houses. We have uh, essentially four, and we have a fifth person, but he's off to the, he wasn't even injured at all. He was the first to DD right. out of the place. Um, right. And that we have other burns. So again, okay. they, as they were handing them out, they were putting them in the back of medic unit. The first unit got two, the second unit eventually got two, and the dad got shifted to a BLS unit for transport. Um, but a lot was happening simultaneously. Um, the reason so I, the reason I bring this up, credit, though. don't give me too much credit. I'm really annoying to some of the medics, but they put up with me. <laughs> I, have, I love the self-deprecating humor. The, 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 the reason I bring this up is because when I, when I think back to Parkland, when we had 17 victims, we were piling people on, you know, and we had, you know, a critical, I mean, so a red and two greens, as an example, Chief Cardona did an incredible job of that. And all those 17 lives were saved. So basically you have to make do with what you have is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I mean, even, even, you know, and I don't mean to move back history, but even back in Southeast Asia, if we got, you know, more than 10 or 12 uh, victims at one time, that overwhelmed, uh, you know, a major facility in, in Vietnam. So having lots of people simultaneously is much more difficult than having them sequentially. So would you say then it would be a good way, a, a good thing to actually train on? And, you know, Zach, you can comment on this, uh, Dr. Dorset, Dr. Peel, with, with respect to training, um, are, a, are we training on in, you know, inhalational injury, number one? But then secondly, are we training apart from the competition, which you know, for, for those of you who compete, you know what this, they just throw patients at you. But are you training where they're just giving your, your medics more than one patient at a time? Anyone want to comment on that? No I, think I, I think what I would think is useful to comment on is the uniqueness of this particular situation, because I think the normal thing we train on, right, is like, a multi-patient exercise where there's a bunch of shooting victims or a bunch of trauma victims. But what's unique about the house fire situation is that these are gonna have time critical needs for invasive airway management potentially, which makes this um, a more difficult triage scenario in terms of skills and space um, because right there's not as many situations as I think they think they are that need time critical invasive airway intervention, um, but these patients may fall into that scenario and that makes it unique. Right, I love that comment. And then so Mark, what's your thought on triaging? Uh, so like you have two people, so Mark and his team are about to have two people in the back of one ambulance. You know, if, if, you, if you can just walk people through Mark Peel's mind of, uh, what are the, the important triage things? Yeah, that's, that's a complicated space, I know. But as far as- Yeah, thanks for the easy assessment. question. Yeah. I may defer it what back to Marv, but I guess, guess with my, I'm thinking that, you know, Peter, you and I love to talk about the controversy of pre-hospital airway management invasive versus superglottic airway versus BBM. And we know that a couple of these patients at least mm -hmm. are gonna need a more immediate invasive airway. And so how do we, uh, how do we manage that? I can't wait to get into some of the nuts and bolts of it and see the video, but I think um, our most experienced uh, operator there needs to handle those patients. And hopefully we have two that can divide and conquer with the patients who need the immediate airway intervention, because this will be based on what Marv described, uh, probably a place where it's going to have to be done in the field to save these patients' lives. So um, Perfect. I'm thinking. Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Hillary. 
I'm just going to thank, sorry, Mark. Uh, I just wanted to note that um, James has pointed out in, in our chat that um, uh, a fire with, um, with this many injuries is maybe a more likely scenario to occur than a mass shooting. It's hard to believe that, but I, I wonder if we look, Interesting. you know, yeah. and, and look at what we're training on. I bet all of you will tell me that um, you have done some form, as Dr. Dorsett said, of a, of a uh, MCI uh, that's an act of violence of some kind, but I bet, um, I know I can speak for myself. We haven't done, um, a mul an MCI, uh, with fire, uh, you know, any sort of structure, fire or inhalation right. injuries. So that's really important. Go back to your training officers and talk about that. Great, great comment. And I think after people see what's about to happen, <laughs> I think it's going to stimulate some thought. So let's go to patient number one, Mark, patient number one. Again, these, these are just, these are not real images. Um, but the yeah, first please, patient- please be aware, of, just for everybody, these are not real images of the patients involved in the care. We, we decided right. for, for that, we were, weren't putting that in. We just wanted to kind of get you it's there similar. mentally. This, was, this one's similar. So you have two patients in the back of, the, of, of, of your first ambulance, Medic 2. This is your first, this is one of the patients and you have the other, which we'll get to her next. But he's got a 60% TBSA, total body surface area burn. His airway's fine and his CO level is normal. So take us through that, that initial assessment um, and how he looked and, and some other clinical aspects, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so this guy is, is back, he's moaning. He's really worried about his family because he was trying to break in to get them out. And we assured him, well, his dog, then we put him on, on the seat and we put his daughter <clears throat> and almost simultaneously. In fact, when I arrived, they were just being loaded in the medic too. Um, so he's there, daughter's there. We've got one person working on him to get an IV and, and analgesia, uh, covering him with a burn sheet, but he's awake talking. He's got an open airway. He had a good sat. His CO level was zero because the life pack does read CO. Um, and then daughter, however, is confused, obtundent, and ne near next to him because I don't have any place else, or they didn't. I don't want to give me too much credit. They didn't have any place else at that point to put her. But we calmed him, and then he got attended by one of the one of the third the third medic there, which is the supervisor at the moment. Um, and then uh, we went turned our attention to the daughter. So he got actually so she so he got minimal treatment, clean sheet, IV fluids, dilated, out of here. He got moved to a BLS unit. Okay, so you 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 needed the space, and so while while people were attending to her, so she's on the gurney right in the middle of the of, right. the, of the vehicle, Correct. right, and he's on Correct. the seat. You you kind of do a couple of things to him, and then you get him out of there. You uh, your, your I, resources to the I, BLS I don't truck. Do squat, except try to stay out of everybody's way. No, seriously, there were people doing the things, and I had yeah. a few decisions to help with, um, but mostly these are people that you you, you know they do this mo even they don't do burns every day but they do this kind of care every day. And what you want to do is go with the flow and help. And I have a few, few of them are going to be on this thing, writing notes saying, uh, you know, you don't always do that, but seriously, um, I try to be supportive, not interventive. Okay, perfect. All right. So the next picture you're going to see is not the girl. Just everyone know that Mar Marv was upset at me that I had the girl who was, this I is this a could look like a 13. woman guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She's 13 today. Damn it. She's 13. Okay. All right. So she, she's pretty badly burned to 25, 35%. She mm -hmm. is uptunded. So I would love to hear from, from someone in the crowd. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll start with um, uh, Zach, uh, uh, Maya, Mark. Uh, you know, anyone can take this. Why would a 13-year-old who's uh, come out of a fire be uptunded per se? What, what would be the mechanism there? Or anyone, or anyone can jump in on this one. We got uh, Sam saying um, CO toxicity, Brian. Sure. Hypoxia, Alexander. Hi, uh, Alexander said hypoxia. Got lots of people talking about uh, cyano kits and certainly cyanide poisoning. Um, certainly heading into shock. Anyone want to talk sure. through anything? Feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and chime in. Yeah, so uh, I'd love to hear the comments here. Th those are some great comments. So um, there was one here that cyanide, cyanide haven't... CEO, hypoxia. So they're all they're all there grouped together. Absolutely. Okay, Perfect. so one of them that I would suggest is what's the cause of the fire? We haven't determined what it yes. is. So uh, how do we know that the 13-year-old didn't overdose and set the fire? Mm. <laughs> I love she it. Could be she overdosed. Uh, uh, all right. right. 
you want me to make it that <laughs> complex or you want me to tell you the truth? Go ahead. <laughs> tell us the truth, Marv. Tell us the truth. Truth of the matter is, it's chilly here in January. This was January, as it turns out. I won't get more than that. Um, but there was a space heater that got too close to curtains. And they were just, you know, uh, what can I say? Uh, the, uh, the space heater caught curtains on fire, older home. Uh, things spread very rapidly. The, the back bedroom was somewhat freed of, of, of significant fire, comparatively speaking, but was not free of the entrapment and ex ex excessive amount of smoke and inhalatory material. So, you know. Got it. Uh, yeah, this that's, is. That, 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 that's good information. That, so that, yeah. that was a great. So, but, but I think ev everyone needs to know, and Marv, maybe you can address this. Everyone needs to know that the number one, two, and three reason she's obtunded is the carbon monoxide, which has a 200 plus times more affinity yep. uh, for, right, for, for, the, uh, for the RBC. And so can you, can you just take us through that, what this 30% means and why it's important? The, 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 first of all, you know, yes. It, you know, as somebody once said to me, it's the airway stupid. Well, it's also the oxygen. Um, we were getting a pulse ox that was reading like 98%. Well, we know what that really means uh, right. because you've got the, the, the wavelengths of light for CO and pulse ox are essentially the same. Now, fortunately, we had a new life pack and it was reading CO. So we were getting this off of there. And it was, I think it was reasonably reliable. It probably underreads. But when, you know, you've got all the characteristics of somebody with, and you'll see the airway. And when you go in to see the airway, you go kind of, oh, poop. You know, this is might even worse than we had thought. So, um, you know, the decision okay. now begins to be, what's our next step? Well, we got dad kind of out, off to the side. He's not there. So our decision making is based on the, the 13 year old, which, you know, if I said to any of you today, do you want to go take care of a 13 year old? I think you would have what I call sphincter spasm. And we know what sphincter we're talking about. Um, and now it's only going to get worse because the next one is going to be even younger. Um, and so these decisions have to be made quickly uh, and very, very uh, much more efficiently. Uh, and the other questions, I think somebody said, how far are you from the hospital? We're about 10, 15 minutes ish. Um, and at 4 30 or 5 o'clock in the morning, you know, we can move pretty quickly. But I, you don't, you know, you know we're not going to do an airway in route. We can do it. But why make it the most difficult environment? The child is not going to die from the external burns. No one's going to die there from the external burns. They will die from airway burns. And we're going to see some stuff as we go on through these cases. Uh, about what airways look like and what happens to airways when they have uh, inhalation exposure. So, so okay, so let, let, let's just piece this together. You have the carbon monoxide attaching to the hemoglobin molecule. Um, therefore, now we're not circulating oxygen to a great extent, and therefore mm -hmm. the patient is not getting oxygenation to their brain and other uh, important organs, number one. Secondly, there is, uh, and it, this picture doesn't show it so well, but you, you described that she has soot, she has singed hairs. Um, and so can you talk us through your assessment of what you needed to do? And I think Dr. Dorsett said it beautifully that this is a minutes to seconds decision. How did your medics decide that they had to take her airway right there, right by the house that was being burnt? Well, it was really easy. I got in the back of the rig, the medic turned to me and says, we're innovating her. And I went, oh, okay. Um, you know, I don't want, I deserve, they deserve the credit for, you know, the decision. Give and them I the support. credit, yes. Yeah. Um, so we said, we gotta do, we gotta do her airway now. Um, and we proceeded to what, we're gonna get to the video pretty quickly, I assume. I think the video will explain everything uh, for us. Um, so I'll walk you through the video as you show it. Hey, okay. Before you do, Peter, could you just, Mark, could you describe when you, on that last slide, significant airway compromise, like what were the triggers there that, told you and your team, we've got to manage this airway immediately. Before anyone ever took a look, what, what led them down that path? When all else fails, look at the patient. And that's exactly what everybody did. And I don't mean to sound flippant about that. Um, that's a lear learning lesson we always tell people. You know, you can have all the books in the world, but what really becomes the most important thing is what does the patient look like? And she didn't look good. I'll leave it at that. Now, before we start the video, and again, I'm not, we're not, we're not going to Monday morning quarterback this. Um, what, what access did you have, if you remember? 
and then take us through, through the decisions of medications, yes or no, in this particular case, I know the answer, but I wanna hear it from you so everyone can learn from this, what meds were, 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 were being used here? Okay, so we had an IV access. I think we had a 20 gauge AC, uh, box out there. Um, we had 20 gauge AC and, um, in, in, you know, in her, and they might've even been trying to start us, I doubt it. They had just too much going on and they did all the right things, but you know, you can only do so many right things simultaneously with that many patients. All right, so the decision was made to decide, are we gonna do this with paralytics or without paralytic? And she was pretty obtundent. Um, and so um, we decided to go ahead uh, with minimal uh, sedation, and no paralytic, and you'll see what it looked like. And we were able to intubate her. The thought was we will do the following. We will look. If it looks like it's, uh, we can either suction and intubate without a paralytic, or we will. And one of the value of that is once we have her intubated, we may have to have, we may be able to use a less trained person to ventilate her, okay? Because she will probably have some level of spontaneous breathing. If we do do use a paralytic, at the time we were using sucks, now we're using rock. We would have to put a more experienced person. And again, we only had so many people available and, uh, uh, you know, to, to do all these different things. So, so th there's a very important point here that you mentioned, and I, I want to tease through it a little bit, and I want to bring Mark and Maya and Zach on this, on this one. What specifically were you worried about? And, not, and, and again, I'm not pointing fingers or, or uh, what, what would, and this is, I think, a brilliant idea to just give a little versed, I think that's what you guys gave, and then you did mm -hmm. a little look, a little look first. Yep. Was, was the look because if you would have paralyzed her and you couldn't get an airway, all of a sudden it's a, it's, you're in a, in a dip, more difficult situation? Yep. Yeah. Is that, okay, so, so Mark, you're the airway guru. You, know, you, you and Marv are kind of up there on the top of the mountain, in my opinion. Mark, you know, difficult airway, uh, not paralyzing before you look. What do you think about that? Well, I love it, and I know it's also controversial, but I think this is, there are, there are several conditions in which it would be wise to try that first, and I think this is one of them. So the concept of delayed sequence intubation, meaning you're going to prep the patient, allow them to continue to spontaneously breathe, and then if possible, take a look, and this is really only possible with video laryngoscopy, probably not DL, because we can't get a good look with a direct laryngoscope blade in an unparalyzed patient most of the time. So the combination of pre-oxygenation here, which um, we don't see on this patient right now, but ideally there would be a cannula wide open and a, a medication to allow us to relax the airway a little bit and allow the patient to continue to spontaneously breathe. Marv, you didn't have ketamine at the time. You chose Versed, which is reasonable. Yeah. Um, Today we would use ketamine. Uh, you would use ketamine now, and I agree with that because we don't know what this patient's hemodynamics are. Uh, that's not their primary problem, but something that preserves respiration takes away the sensation of that blade going mm. in and allows us to evaluate the airway and even intubate spontaneous breathing. I think is that this is the ideal patient for it if you can do it. Um, yeah, right. Taking a look to see yeah. it, so what, I, what, how swollen is that epiglottis and our airway before I attempt to pass a tube. Well, let me make two comments. One, Peter, we got to get through all three of the P kids' videos, no matter what we do, because they've got way too much. Mom is a plus minus, so I'm just pushing you a little. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm um, ready. And, and so let's look at this. Let's look at, yes, I will accept the criticism. We did not have high flow nasal cannula when we did the intubation, and I don't remember the circumstances, so that's a criticism, and I'll take it. That's okay. That's okay. Okay, let's play it, James. Back of the ambulance. Here we are. Marv, you want to walk us through it? Yeah, so we open the mouth. You can see that she is still breathing. Um, and you see a lot of schmutz coming out of her airway. Can you see it? Yeah, and you can Everybody see she's see breathing this? spontaneously. Yeah, yep. yes, spontaneously and breathing. breathing. Yep. And we said we got a view. She's not bucking it. We are going to try to suction. I mean, this stuff pouring out of her lungs. You can see yep. it. Yep. it pouring yep. out of her lungs. And there's no way I could describe that without the video. And so the medic is slipping the tube and trying to get through all the schmutz. And then he is able to, uh, uh, this was a he. Yeah, it's one of our male medics. Um, 
is able to get through that membrane, you actually doesn't look, look almost looks worse. Schmutz is a medical term, yeah, sorry. Uh, the, uh, they're able to slide it in. There we go. That's it. There you go. But you see the swelling, already early swelling around the, the area retinoid folds, the glottic openings, the oral cavity, and all of the debris. I mean, that's debris coming out of the lungs. Yep. Wow. That, that, that's pretty significant. Um, and I would also imagine that with only midazolam, I mean, this, this is obviously, um, you know, is this, a, this is a hyperangulated blade, so you weren't really having to pull up on her. Is that correct? Yeah. So this... We were, so let me give you our, our airway history. It, I'm, we're not giving sales pitch. Um, we were originally started working with GlideScope a long time ago because Jack Pacey and the folks who live right next door to me up in Burnaby, BC, and we were good friends. Uh, they built uh, a Glide, took GlideScope Ranger and built an add-on box to do video recording. So when we did our comparative studies that we published, we were able to validate some of the numbers with video recording like this does. So this probably was the GlideScope Ranger with the recorder. We later moved from the GlideScope Ranger to the UEScope, that's U-E-S-C-O-P-E, -E, which we now are in the second generation of. Again, a recording scope. Uh, we've now has disposable blades and features we like. I'm not bad mouthing any scope except to say, if it doesn't record, it isn't what you want. Uh, and there are many recording types on the market today. And if you want to talk to me offline, that's offline. I'm not here to... King Vision, yeah. um, I think record some of them record. We do not use that. Okay, so okay. moving so, along. Wait, 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 wait. I have a question for you now. So the girl's intubated with only midazolam. She's still breathing spontaneously. Yep. Does she end up needing any other medications? Was she bucking the yep. vent? I mean, I could I could imagine only that she with only some brissage, she's not feeling so good right now. We we did not we did not put her on a vent. We had some auto vents. Uh, just too much going on. And we did have enough bodies to squeeze a bag gently. Uh, one comment I will make, we threw away the footballs. Our bags today are 800 to 900 cc's. They have manometers and a timing light. So if we're not using the ITD, our timing light goes on. So the medic or EMT or whosoever knows when to squeeze it. They have manometers and they have a peep valve option. So Got we it. are very, very careful about overventilation. Nice. nice, okay, well, so here we are now. That's ambulance number one fixed. Uh, and, you know, they're getting 100% FiO2. We know why that is. Um, and they're getting that. She did get the a other... little bit. She got some more midazolam. She got a small amount of Bilotid, uh, which is what we were using. Okay. Uh, and she got, then they took off. You know, they did okay. the so, Perfect. Okay. Here we are. Met... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Maya. Yep. I think it's really useful to talk about this debate of neuromuscular blockade for this particular patient. Um, and also, right, she has more than midazolam, she is 30% CO. So <laughs> that's why you can get away with a little bit of mm -hmm. uh, midazolam there, yep. right? She is, she yep. started out obtunded from 30% CO, which is probably more than or the midazolam more. affect her mental status. Yep. But I think if you think about what could have made that intubation easier, that was pretty smooth. Um, but at the same time, you were trying to work against moving cords and things that were sort of coming back at you. And when I think in terms of, you know, some people say like, oh, I don't want to give rock because then if I don't get it, then I can't go back. But the airways that we're taking, not getting it is not an option, right? Like I've decided to take this airway because she is obtunded with signs of airway burns. So my ability to secure that airway is absolutely necessary. So if I go in there and the air, you know, like I need to get the, I need to get the airway. And so I have to optimize my first pass success in a super high risk airway. And so while many, you know, there's a few operators who might be able to get that in the spontaneously breathing patient, I think optimizing success, the data suggests that these are patients who you probably, I'm gonna debate Mark's kind of things, you no. probably want to give neuromuscular blockade too, because it's not an option whether or not this airway gets secured. I'm doing it because I've made the critical decision. I'm going to take this airway in the field because there's edema. And by the time they get to the hospital, I'm going to have to go through the neck. So, all right. Yeah, so Maya, me, I would just say, Maya, that. I would just say, go ahead, Mark. Mark, 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 Mark
there was an IV, uh, a syringe stuck into the IV tubing with succinylcholine drawn up, ready to go. So I completely agree. But my idea was my idea. Their idea was was mine. We're going to look, and if it looks like that did, and we can get the tube in without going any further, we're going to do it. If we'd have gone in there and there was bucking or difficulty or we didn't have one great shot, we'd have come back. She'd have got sucks and more midazolam, and then we'd have placed the tube. So I'm agreeing, but disagreeing in the sense that we just got lucky. And we're going to see, that's why it's important we see these additional patients, because you'll see what other additional approaches we took. Right. I agree. Mark, go ahead. I would just, I, I totally agree with that. And my, my, my solution would be the rock or the sucks is ready to go on the IV. Should you have trouble, yep. it goes in and you, then you have the re more relaxed airway, but you haven't lost anything by looking first while the patient's spontaneously breathing fresh oxygen. It just gives, it just buys you a little more time to assess uh, what you're look, what you have before you, before you paralyze. Cor correct. Right. That's what yeah. I thinking or their thinking, all of our thinking. Um, and that's why, and that's why medicine is an art. And uh, but I, I, I thought that that little wrinkle of looking. But what happened here is that you look and you're like, oh, I can see the air, I can see the cords, and then it was, you, you made that spontaneous decision of, hey, let's just go and get that airway. Yep. Yeah. So, and, but that, that, but I wanted people to hear that. I wanted people to hear Dr. Dorset's comments as well because those are very well taken as well. Yeah. Uh, great, great, great uh, discussion. Okay, right, Peter. Let's, let's keep, get to let's the next one. On. Yeah. Let's keep moving on. Here we are, medic one. Now the, diff the difficulty here, Marv, you have two obtunded patients in this in the back of this ambulance. You can't get rid of this of one of them like you did the other one. Yep. So let's start with a ten year old, thirty percent TBSA. Again, thirty percent CO. Uh, you know, all the classic it stops reading at thirty. Okay. Well, so that's so they go high, right? Meters yep. high. Um, all the classic findings of soot in the airway, the singed hair, and so forth you have yourself another innovation on your hands. Is that correct? Yep, and, and if you thought a 13-year-old got you sphincter spasm, I hate to say what a 10-year-old does. And, and as James is putting up that, air, that, 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 that the, the video, it's important to understand that because of how kids' airways are, are, are they're, they're more funnel-shaped, yep. they have, um, you know, their tongues are larger and so forth, all of that swelling, you know, the diameter of their trachea is smaller, they have the ability to, you, you can lose their airway much more quickly. It's a, it's a much more sphincter tone kind of thing. So uh, let's walk through this video, Mar. This is the 10 year old, take it hey, away. Peter, again. before before we oh. do this video, there's a really important comment in the chat. Um, Dr. Dorsett, talk to us about eye gel because someone just asked us about would an eye gel work here and we wanna make sure we, we talk about uh, that utility. Do, do you want me to answer what my thinking is? Oh, I, I was just asking Dr. Dorsett since she um, she saw. Okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no worries. I can, I'd love to hear. Right I'd love to hear your take on it, Marv. So I'm go for it. Somebody else's, because I I'd rather not be the only one wrong. Um, <laughs> there, first of all, the problem with the supraglottic airway, what's really wonderful, it doesn't solve the problems of of edema, and you're going to see what I mean in a, just a couple of minutes. Yeah. So yeah, the supraglottic is be supra, but not very good for the glottic. Thanks. Keep going, Peter. Okay, James, so, so we'll just play it and Marv will walk us through it, play by play. Okay, so now there's the 10 year olds. Again, you see the soot on the face, the burns, the nose. Oh, look at that swelling. That. And you're sneaking in and you're sneaking in and you're sneaking in. And this one is paralyzed. We gave, we gave paralytic because he was moving too much. She was moving too much. So now here's the error. What is the first error you see there? Very small on airway. What do you see? Everybody's in a panic and they hand, an EMT hands the medic a tube. What's wrong with that tube? Someone said uncuffed Someone? And, uh, yeah. and it's too small. Amy, Amy is right. Amy yeah. right, small tube, right. Good, yeah. good answer, oh, Amy. Okay. And, and I was not, I had turned away to look at the other patient needing to be an abated mom, 33 years old, is also crumping slightly. Um, and I turned back and they had put this in. It's a four. Uh, this is way too small for a 10 year old. Uh, now what do you do? Tell me what to do, Mark. It's in and I'm able to ventilate with it. 
Someone asked about so, a bougie exchange. What do we think? Uh, okay. I'm asking other people what to do. And then I'm going to tell you what we ended up doing. Let's see what if people can add to the comments. Um, yeah. Let's see. It is too small, Eric. It's too small for an adult bougie. That's exactly yep. right. You That's exactly right. I agree. Use a bougie here. Okay. I would just I would exchange it for one with a cuff immediately because you're not going to be able to ventilate that patient without a cuff, and their oh. and their 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 significant lung disease is going to be is going to hurt you. So that you need you're going to need peep and elevated pressure, and that cuffless tube is not going to help you there. Okay. So I'll do a mea culpa. Uh, <laughs> I made the decision since we also had mother to deal with. And believe it or not, we were ventilating pretty easily with this tube. And the kid had been paralyzed and made it even easier. Um, and we're having, you know, we still got the, the shit storm around us. They're, they've knocked down the fire, but we've got, you know, residual of everything. The first medic unit is taken off of the hospital. Um, and now we got to turn to mom, who we may or may not have time to see, has also got a, a horrible airway. Uh, yeah, so we I will. Made, we will. I, I made the decision to hold tight. Let's just use it enough till we get to the hospital, and then let's readdress it. Okay. Okay. So or how about, how about we do this? I, this was my decision, not the medic's decision. Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to ask, did you have a massive leak or, or were you getting good chest rise and you felt like you were managing it? Amazingly so. Um, it, we got chest rise. We got a good, easy air exchange. I actually squeezed the bag some just to get a feel. And as we're trying to do, there's just so much you can do. And my fear was, you know, any port in a storm, scared man in a bucket, great bilge pump. I got something in this airway. Um, you know, what's going to happen with next try? Where am I going to, you know, I, that was just my decision. The medic said, what do you want to do, doc? And this time I made the decision. I said, it's working. We'll, we'll deal with it at the hospital. So, so, so Marv, I want to, I want to understand though, that, and, and we'll show in the video later after, after the adult one, that there, that there are risks for waiting. Absolutely. Are the, same, are the same risks that we're trying to avoid by doing it now. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna steal your thunder there, but James, let's go to the uh, to the mother now, 33 year old female, also um, having significant airway uh, issues, and she needs to be intubated as well. Uh, let me let me get the she has 25 percent TBSA. She her CO is 40 percent. Uh, she has an IO in place, and now she's got to be intubated. So Marv, take it away. Okay, so let's go ahead, uh, James. You want to go ahead and start running the video? This is mom. You can see again, airway, soot, schmutz, excuse me, uh, lung content regurgitating. Schmutz is my term. Um, and she was heavily sedated and we decided, we went ahead and paralyzed her. And you can, again, just see all the insanity. You can see, see the, the, you know, she was tricky to innovate, they were deep. That's a chronic problem with both all these all the video scopes, including the hyperangulated. And so they, I looked, leaned over and I said, pull back, you're too deep. And then they were able to pull back a little, they got a better view. There Again, we go. this is real, this is all real. I'm not making this up. I'm not giving you only the good stuff and they got it in, okay? So now she's intubated with an appropriate size tube and we are, we are heading for the hospital. All right, perfect. So let me let me just uh, share this one more time so people see a little bit of what happened there. She was at Iowa's place. You are a cider, uh, you know, with paralytic, et cetera. Tube just placed, as we just saw. That lot was given to her. And now, so now you have two. Now, where were those done, by the way? In the same ambulance? Yeah, they were done in the same ambulance. Medic One's already gone to the hospital. Uh, right. And I, I had a, I might have had a BLS unit there, but remember the medic units got all the toys, um, and and that was just just the reality. You know, it, you know, if I went back and you did this as a textbook case, I would say, oh, we would, we should do this, we should do that, and everything. But these were literally split second decisions that were made. Sure. Uh, so sure. I will take the blame for leaving the tube, um, and the first one we just did not need to to, to paralyze the no, other two. We're not we did we're not we're not blaming anybody, but we again this is just incredible stuff. So James, now let's take it to the emergency department. 
How long, Marv, do you think it's been between the first, that when that 4.0 tube went in and now you're trying to place, I presume, something like a 6.5 cuff tube? Yep. What's the span of time there? Uh, probably 12, 14 minutes max. So what in that is, short span of time, you, you start to run into some trouble here, right? Yes. So what happened is we, we're zooming in the ER. Um, I came in and one of my, I have, I have essentially by now I've got a second doc. We normally at that time in the morning, we should have one. They called the minute they heard what was going on. They called the 6 a.m. doc in. Um, so I got two docs. I got the entire front trauma rooms. There's four beds are set up. Um, and I walked in with this other, these other two. And one of my partners looked at me and said, at least one of them's yours. So they, I was essentially coming to work. Uh, so I took the kid. Now, when we moved the kid, the 402 ended up where 402 tubes that are way too small like that and aren't secured sufficiently end up on the floor. So now we've got to reintubate the kid because this is not a kid that I can leave without sufficient airway protection. And you're going to see what happened. And this was a judgment call. I should have made the change the tube there and then. I didn't. And here's what happened. Here we go. Let's play it. So this is a medic doing this. I am not doing this innovation. I said, this has been the medic's call up until now. Look at the core. Look you. at the area written on folds. Wow. That's some significant yeah. swelling right there. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this cuff tube, I think it was a six or six five. Now, what do you know about tubes? They're beveled. And that bevel, if you crank it to the right, is a corkscrew. So now I'm standing over the medic going, just keep pushing and cranking. Just keep pushing and cranking. Just get, you've got to get the tube in because anything smaller is not going to work and I can't suction through. So you see him kind of gently pushing. I know in a perfect world, this ain't, ain't perfect. I don't have a bougie. I don't know if I, I probably did have a Pete's bougie, but by now the tube was on the floor. Um, and there he goes with his gentle twisting and gentle pushing and me pushing Ooh. him. Um, corkscrew the tube. Wow. That, that, that'll get anyone's heart rate up. Uh, any, you know, all of us who have <laughs> innovated many kids in our lifetime are still have a high heart rate. So let, let, let's bring in Mark and Maya. The problem and, and, was my and, sphincter. Yeah, exactly. So Mark, you go first. I want to hear from Maya after that. What do you think about that? Uh, well, that one, thank you for saving all these folks' lives with your team, um, Mark. You guys did awesome work. And please don't take any of my comments, my Monday morning quarterback no, comments no, I negatively. I, just, I love this stuff. And <laughs> my favorite comment that I've seen come in so far is calling Dr. Ducanto. So does anyone know what that means? The, the yeah, salad know, technique. Yeah. So all, all these patients could have benefited by going in first to the Yankauer or Ducanto catheter and clearing all that goo out of there, all that schmutz out first. You have a better look. So that's number link one. Is in, link is in the chat. Go ahead. Yep. Number two, I think you, you did it brilliantly and, and you, you chose a smaller tube and that child, and I understand why, but you see some of the problems, how quickly, number one, that airway is swelled in between, right? So it, that's just proving that the kids needed to have airway management in the field because they're going to lose that airway soon. But I think the hesitation about a cuff tube, we've mostly left behind now, but I think this, this share, we, we see the, the value of that lesson. These patients are going to have horrible lung disease. They're going to have a ton of secretions. We're going to need to ventilate them with relatively high pressures. And at some point that uh, cuff is going to be necessary. So starting with, with uh, from scratch with that one. And then lastly, if I can just throw the, I'm not arguing with, with Maya in any way about the, the paralysis versus not, but I think this situation where you don't have the ability to do a surgical airway, you don't have a lot of backup. I think that the DSI technique of looking first for the good dose of ketamine while oxygen is flowing gives you a little bit more margin of safety before committing to the paralytic. So those are my, my so thoughts. And we could have my the use of the these patients, but I think that would have really lost, I'd have lost control of both ends. So let's not, right. we didn't want to go there. Okay, uh, Maya, and then I'm going to bring in Zach. Go ahead, Maya. Now, I was going to say that, like, my heart rate, like, if you had plotted, it went up like this. And when that two passed the cords, like, I literally had like, <laughs> uh, pressure relieved off my chest just watching it. And so I can't even imagine being the person just hoping that that goes through. Um, I think that this shows what effective team management can do. And then even when teams are, right, like, errors happen in the context, like the tube, the wrong tube gets handed, but it's how do you react as a team and think through the problem and find what the patients need. And 
there's never really the expectation of perfection. There's expectation of reassessment and problem solving in situations that you never anticipated having. And I think that's all really impressive that was done here. And I think that there's multiple approaches to these, but I think that what this shows is there are situations where you need to have invasive airway management in the field because this was a 12 to 15 minute transport time, right? Um, and many places it would actually be a longer transport time and then the tube wouldn't fit at all. And so thinking about how do you have the resources, whether or not that's a specialty resource in your area versus not, how do these things get deployed to these particular situations where you're gonna need highly skilled providers as Marv and his team were to manage multiple difficult airways, um, I think is something to think ahead on. Great, yeah. great comments. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, wait, uh, don't happen again. Yeah. Let's, let's bring in Zach. So Zach, you, you, you've been in these situations a number of times. What, what's your thought on, on, you know, not just that last innovation, but just, you know, the whole sequence in general, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think the first thing is just uh, proper preparation prevents piss poor performance, right? And obviously these guys were ready. Um, I agree with Dr. Dorsett that I kind of always, once I decide I'm going to take an airway, I'm going to do it the same way. I want to use first attempt, best attempt, and the, the paralytic may, may uh, give me that opportunity. And I also agree with Dr. Peel. This is one of those cases where I may not have done it, right? So um, I think it's just, it's great discussion. Um, and then the last thing I would say is this is the one where you got to be ready to cut the neck. You've got to be, you got to be ready. So just make that part of your prep preparation. Your RSI checklist, I think is huge here. Um, and it's also a unique case where I need to have that, that smaller uh, size tube in case I get in that airway that I wasn't anticipating to see all the swelling. So Overall, just a really great call and great discussion. Love, I love, Zach, how you think is incredible, man. You, like, it's all about preparation. You have the whole sequence in mind. If it goes well, if it doesn't go well. Let me throw out a couple other thoughts here. Some people are saying lubricant. Some people are saying steroids. Uh, we, we've now heard cut the neck now um, from Zach. Is, is there, are, are there any other pearls here that we should be throwing out to, to, so that people... Uh, start to think about what the, the physiology may be when the next time they end up in the situation. We want to hear from the docs, uh, Peter, about um, uh, cyanide and. Um, yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. So yes. let's Marv. do let's do a real Marv quick and I one talked and about this. we'll wrap. Okay. Yeah. So we did not have that many cyano kits uh, in our uh, medic units and in our hospital at the time. We had one. Uh, and the MS supervisor rig, remember these are very expensive and they were just kind of coming into vogue and the old stuff was absolutely worthless. Uh, unless you pull the poppers out for a good time. Um, but reality, the reality of these kids are all too young. Um, the reality is that, uh, that we didn't have enough, we should have in retrospect. Um, and there's a couple, I'm not gonna get into aftercare because there's some issues with hyperbarics and all these other things. So let me just say, Care up to the hospital, you got to see, you got a short period in the hospital. After that, eventually they went to the burn center. Was this all by ground? Someone's uh, texting me, that, were, were helicopters involved here at all or not? Yeah, they took them to the burn center by air. Okay. We, got two, we got the airlift helicopters. Okay, so okay, so there, there you go, wow. You, we're you part, of, every... part of the airlift, so one of them was sitting on the pad. But there's no way I'm okay. going to fly him on a 12 minute, you know, 15 minute response to the ER. Wow. Wow. Incredible. Marv, I tell you what, I think all of us on this call are thinking a few things. Number one is thank you for, you know, kind of putting yourself out there, your team out there, number one, but even better, even more so. I think we all are thinking here that you just have an incredible team. You obviously are an incredible leader, incredible medical director. You have an amazing amount of experience. And uh, I just so happy that you were able to kind of bring this case to us. Um, take us away with some final points here. If you, if you could relive this again, what are some take home points for some people here that are first year people, that are 30 year people? What does Marv Wayne say to those people? Whatever you expect you're going to see will not be. It will always be worse than you anticipate. Always anticipate that it will be worse and always prepare. And remember, it's the airway, stupid. Um, you may not do everything right, but if you do most of it right, you'll save the patient. Wow. And then, you know, listen, um, 
if you, if, if, I know that you have a lot of these types of cases. If people want to see you, and uh, I know that you present these cases um, on stage in many places, um, where, where can people find you or learn more about your techniques? Maybe come to a lab or your training. Tell people about that. Um, well, my email is m w a y n e m wayne at Watcom w h a t c o m county all one word Watcom County dot us. You know, I'm always happy to share because we only learn because we learn from each other, and we only do because we share our experiences with each other. Nothing in the world is perfect except death and taxes, and I'm not so certain about the first one nowadays. So. And with that great ending, Hillary, let me kick it back over to you and we'll take it away. Thanks everybody. Everyone, thank you so much. Happy EMS week. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at Real Emergency, on Facebook, go and like us, uh, watch our YouTube videos. And uh, thanks again to our education supporter, Axon Studios. Thank you, Dr. Antevi, Dr. Peel, Dr. Dorsett. Thank you, Zach Dunlap. And everyone have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.